We'll welcome them into the conversation. So hello, everyone, again. Uh, my name is Claire Fitzgerald. Uh, I'm a research fellow here at the Government Outcomes Lab, and so happy to have you at today's uh, sort of uh, well, today's session, right? Or emergency responses and government outcomes, your learning group. Can I ask that if you are on the line and not speaking, you go ahead and mute your phone. I'm getting a bit of uh, noise on the line. Thank you. Um, so thanks for spending some time with us today. Uh, as always, we'll start with a bit of group business and then we'll move into today's agenda. Um, so first off, like I've said at all of our sessions so far, Ergo, I've seen a lot of new names on today's registration. So Ergo is supposed to provide an online platform for folks in government, provider organizations, and the academy, as well as other sectors to sort of share their current experiences of emergency and disaster response and recovery. This is including COVID-19 as well as other kind of experiences. And the idea here is that we, we all together reflect on the implications for outcomes-based approaches as well as other government action. Um, so I want to say a big thanks to everyone who has uh, participated uh, or provided feedback so far. Your contributions have really been valued by the team and I. Um, and for those of you who... I think EBRT is also contemplating to potentially extend its geography. One second. There we go. Um, so again, thanks for all of your participation and feedback along the way. I hope you'll see a lot of this fed into the conversation today and future ones. Um, also, if you've not provided feedback or you have some at the end of the session today, or if you want to participate on a future Ergo call, um, you can email the team any ideas you might have at the details which are listed at the bottom of your agenda. We also have a quick online survey if you want a bit of structure to your feedback. You can also find the link to that at the bottom of your agenda. So for those of you who weren't able to join us last session, I also provided a bit of updates on the cadence of upcoming meetings. And so I'll say this again for folks joining today so folks can plan schedules. Moving forward, we're moving to two sessions a month and those will be falling regularly on the first and the second Wednesday of the month. So the first session of each month will be a structured conversation like we're having today. The second session of each month will be more discussion based um, and so this means that the next ergo session will be Wednesday next week, the 13th of May, and that will be at 3.30 p.m. UK. Um, and there we will be discussing the longer term implications of alternative payment arrangements for impact bonds. So in particular, kind of what does switching to a fee for service payment now mean for your impact bond 12 months from now? Um, so that session is a bit more structured perhaps than other open sessions have been. We'll do a presentation on some thinking that has been done by partners around UK outcomes funds. We'll again invite projects to sort of talk through what the decision points have been thus far in their own experience. And then we'll have a lot more time than we will probably have today for discussion with everyone on the line. Um, also, in terms of outputs from ergo sessions, uh, everyone is owed a bit of a mea culpa from me. These have taken a bit longer than I had hoped, uh, but I will be circulating notes from our first two ergo uh, conversations later this week, just to jog memories. Um, these cover COVID-19 and flexibilities and outcomes contracts, as well as uh, discussion points from the first open session that we held. Um, and there we heard about the operational realities of outcomes projects in Cameroon and Belgium. Um, so if you missed these sessions, you can also check them out uh, on our website. We've got recordings as well as or additional details and things like that. So, um, and then also, as I always say, uh, if we compose any policy briefs or memoranda which stem from these ergo conversations, we will share those with participants and to enable both those kind of policy facing out. There we go, as well as a circuit of notes. Uh, am I muted right now or am I unmuted? We can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, as well as the circulation of notes, we're going to record today's session. So, onwards and upwards, um, since we are kind of uh, all virtual and our numbers are, are, are somewhat large, uh, it is con it, the conversation is quite structured today. Um, I know everyone's an old pro at video conferencing, but I just wanted to sort of share a few gentle reminders. Um, the first 
is uh, it is nice to see people's faces. So if you're in a position to do so, it'd be great if you could keep your video on. I would ask that you keep yourself muted unless you are speaking. Um, we will follow timings in the agenda as best we can and we'll invite comments and questions. Um, when this does happen, if you want to speak, we suggest you use the raise hand feature, uh, which you can find through the participants uh, tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, and when you speak, please introduce yourself. And so that helps us understand who you are, what kind of organization you're with, and then also clarify a bit about sort of the point of view or the relationship you might have with other people in a, an outcomes arrangement. Um, I also know it can be kind of intimidating to ask a question in front of lots of people online, um, but rich discussion does require participation and everyone is friendly here. So please jump on in if you do have a question. Uh, nevertheless, if you prefer to type in, we will be checking the chat uh, as well and sort of feeding in some of the written uh, correspondence into the discussion as we can. We will do our best to get to everyone, but we will undoubtedly miss folks. So apologies for that in advance. So let's talk about what we're talking about today. Um, so by popular demand, a lot of people have asked for a session particular to lower and middle income countries. And today we are exploring how stakeholders in these countries are reacting to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I think what was interesting about some of the comments that we had coming in is that folks are really flagging that while response and recovery is potentially made more challenging by lower capacity and capabilities, um, it, in lower and middle income countries, these countries are also disproportionately impacted by humanitarian and natural crises compared to higher income countries. Um, and it's important, I think, to understand these differences on their own merits, as well as distill lessons out of them when developing sort of emergency management responses to COVID-19 for countries really across the income spectrum. Um, and as you'll see in the agenda, today's session is in two parts. And I'll actually be handing the first part over to my colleague, Andrea, to facilitate. So Andrea, could you just hop on real quick, say hello so folks can put uh, a face to your name. So hi everyone, it's Andrea here. Excellent. So Andrea is going to be guiding us through our lightning round um, as marked by lightning bolts in your agenda. And so we've got four speakers lined up who will be doing the impossible of sharing very brief uh, thoughts on the following questions. How are you and your project partners responding to and adapting outcomes-based contracts to COVID-19? How have lessons from past emergencies informed your current approaches? And what can be learned from your response efforts and applied elsewhere? So as I said, they've got the enviable task of distilling all of this wisdom and knowledge in a very brief presentation. They've got a 15 minute window of time. So short presentation and we'll follow that with questions and comments for the speaker that has just spoken. And if there's any unused discussion time at the end of the session, we may open up to discussions or for questions and comments to the full panel. In the second part of the session, we've teed up folks with varying professional backgrounds and perspectives to respond to what's get set get said in the lightning round. Yeah. And they'll be offering sort of brief reactions in order to underscore previous points, maybe identify important things that have been left out of the conversation or give us a nice distillation of, of what's happened. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Andrea. Great, right, thanks Claire. Thanks so much for such an excellent introduction. Uh, hello everyone, I hope you can all hear me okay. I have been known to forget to unmute myself and then wonder why no one's responding to me. So please someone shout uh, if I forget to unmute myself throughout the conversation. Great to see so many people on the line. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Andrea and within the GoLab team I coordinate our engagement and capacity building work. Uh, we've got some absolutely brilliant speakers with us this afternoon, so I just suggest we jump straight into the first presentation. So we'll hear from Louise first, um, who will provide some overarching reflections on some of the particular challenges um, that um, are emerging in low and middle income countries in relation to outcomes based contracts and impact bonds. Um, and then over to Richard, Maria, and Abba for more specific reflections on particular projects. Um, so over to you, Luis, if you can hear us and if you're ready to go. 
I can. Let me just do that. Very good. Um, thank you, Andrea, and thank you, Claire, for inviting me to speak today. Um, it's a real privilege to have this opportunity to share some thoughts and experiences for, for discussion. Um, I think it's important to emphasise this. I think our thoughts are very nascent, so um, I'm not, I'm afraid, going to be offering up firm conclusions so much as sharing emerging learnings and, and a few early reflections. Um, as Andrea said, I'm a director at Social Finance, um, and we have uh, three impact bonds that are currently live in lower middle income countries, one in Cameroon, focused on neonatal health, one in the West Bank, uh, which Richard may speak to uh, after me, around schools for jobs, one in Cambodia around rural sanitation, and then various programs that we're supporting through partners in, in Latin America, which I'm, I'm not going to touch on so much today. Um, I think in terms of the questions that we're grappling with at the moment, they will be the same as they are for many of you. So I think the first question we're asking ourselves at the moment is, what are we learning about the resilience of outcomes-based contracts to adapt to much more radical contextual change than we had foreseen when, when the contracts were structured? Um, and then I think we're also starting to think a little bit about what role outcomes-based contracts or outcomes-based approaches might play in post-COVID recovery. But I'm going to start today um, conscious that um, in previous uh, ergo meetings, some participants have, have been more UK focused, just with a very brief bit of horizon scanning around similarities and, and differences uh, between low income countries and high income countries in the context of, of COVID. Um, you know, the, the overarching similarity that we see, I guess, is that countries across the world are simultaneously facing both a public health and a public finance crisis and that 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 is going to be underpinning both their current response and also i think the the context in these countries for for months and years to come whereas in the uk and other higher income countries the narrative is around flattening the curve um, in terms of health systems. I think we're very conscious that in many low income countries, health systems aren't coping uh, with pre-COVID um, demand, let alone necessarily have the capacity within them to stretch to, um, to respond in, 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 in a full way uh, in the current climate. Um, you know, Africa suffers more than 22% of the global burden of disease, but has only 3% of the health workers and less than 1% of the financial resources. It's important I think when we're talking today to keep those kinds of um, contextual pieces um, in mind as well as to acknowledge that in many of the many low-income countries health access is, is determined by your ability to pay for services either formally or, or informally. So I guess that's, that's, that's one thing that I wanted to just note at the beginning. I think it's also worth noting that the non-health context is very different. Um, there may be very real challenges around the ability of people to social distance in very crowded urban areas. Um, many countries, low-income countries, have very high proportions of people that are working in the informal economy and therefore may be entirely bypassed by any kind of formal economic support um, packages that are put out into the market. Um, there's often very weak social safety nets and social security systems um, such that as people are finding their incomes hit they may struggle to, to access those um, and there may be quite weak public health surveillance systems as well to identify um, some of the issues that are coming through and, and indeed how the disease is, is tracking. Um, so, so I think that's just important framing in terms of both what we're seeing at the moment in the contracts that we're working on, but also what that might mean and how we collectively reflect on, on what appropriate responses and how outcomes based approaches might might support. In terms of the immediate impact of COVID-19 on the live contracts that we're involved in, um, there are a few, I guess, elements to, to how we're thinking about that. Firstly, we've been really reassured that in all cases that we're working on, there is genuine cross-party consensus around a desire for service delivery to continue. So we have, we have not encountered any instances of investors or outcomes funders saying that they want to, to terminate uh, a program early um, because of contextual challenges. I think almost contrary to that, and I'm working very closely with the Ministry of Health in Cameroon at the moment, um, we are seeing that within the Ministry of Public Health there, there is a very deep concern about the impact that COVID-19 might have on some of 
the other health programs, core health programs around childhood vaccinations, around antenatal, antenatal and maternal health care, um, around micronutrient programs, etc. These very hard won gains that they've made in terms of health care over the last 10, 15 years. A real concern that COVID might, might radically re, kind of uh, offset those or, or um, delay them in some way um, that is informing, I think, some of how they're thinking about their approach to COVID at the moment. I think we are seeing an immediate impact on operations um, in all the countries that we're operating in. We're seeing travel restrictions, limiting the ability of clinical and non-clinical staff uh, in our programs to access target groups. We're seeing um, patient concerns in our hospital-based programs, uh, limiting their willingness to come back for healthcare follow-up. We're seeing um, challenges around data collection, around verification agents being able to access the data or the patient contact that they need um, or the client contact that they need in order to assess whether outcomes have been achieved. We're also in the health related programs seeing additional requests for, for um, personal protective equipment for staff over and above um, what pub the public health system is providing. Um, but that's maybe a, a separate issue. Um, in the programs that we're running, we are seeing the operations teams shifting to online delivery of services and remote outcomes verification where possible. That's easier for some programs than others. Um, you know, I think very vulnerable populations often have quite ac uh, limited access to online services or, or reliable internet. Um, equally, um, you know, the, the, the ability of clinical staff to get access to phones or um, uh, internet facilities when they're in the hospitals with patients can be quite, quite challenging. Um, so providing continuing professional development in some contexts and providing training has had to take, has, is having to be quite radically rethought. Um, in relation to that, I guess, we're also, we've also been stepping back with partners and rethinking where outcomes might need to be redefined or priorities might need to be adjusted. Um, so in our neonatal health program in Cameroon, we're very conscious that caregiver, the psychological health of caregivers and their ability to be responsive to their child is, has, is likely to become as important almost as the physical health of the baby and physical indicators around that. So the program there is important implementing things like telephone follow-up calls to weren't doing before post-discharge with, with mothers. Um, similarly, I think in the West Bank, and Richard, I'm sure we'll talk more to this, we're thinking particularly about maybe reprioritizing the sectors that we were thinking about providing skills training around to refocus on, on healthcare, on health and safety, on kind of priority sectors that are likely to be needed over the, the coming months. Um, and the final thing I think that we're seeing in, in our live programs is that in almost all incidents, um, or in almost all uh, cases, we're being asked to think about a plan B. So where every possible effort is being made to shift outcomes verification to remote uh, basis, we are nevertheless being asked to, to plan for a, a, a contingency in which it becomes unfeasible to continue that verification in any form or where operational uh, enrollment is affected to such a great degree that actually it's no longer financially sustainable through say volumes of, of, of client or, or, or um, population enrollment uh, in the program, it may, there may come a point where it's just not financially sustainable to keep being paid on an outcomes basis. Um, and so because partners are all keen for services to continue, that we're having to rethink a sort of plan B for that in, in all cases. Um, stepping away a little bit from, just, just to um, finish off, stepping away from our kind of live programs to think about you know, what potential, if any, outcomes-based approaches might have in the response and recovery effort. I think we are very conscious that, that they may not be well suited to the immediate crisis response, that some of these contracts, the fine tuning of them, the payments, the outcomes metrics, the verification approaches has historically taken a, such a period of time to get right that actually um, it may not be that it's easy to mobilize new outcomes based contracts in, in the immediate few months. I think we see real value in some of the principles that underlie the contracts, um, things like the value of cross-sector partnerships, the need to align partners around a clear defini definition of success, 
the value of using data to monitor progress and to course correct very quickly. And indeed, I think um, the, the transparency and the accountability that these contracts bring, not just for how money is spent, but for the impact that's achieved with that funding, I think we, we think is, is really important. And I guess the incentives that get created by these contracts in terms of adaptive delivery, efficiency of spending, and potentially innovation when new approaches are needed to, to serve new needs, um, I think we think is very important and will have a role. We see, I guess, looking forward, particular need perhaps around training and reskilling when economies reopen, around education, getting kids back into, work, into school and learning, particularly maybe female children, reflecting on lessons from the Ebola crisis, that, seem, that may seem to be a priority. Nutrition, we think, could be quite badly affected, food security in some of these contexts. And then these core health programs, re-establishing the core health programs alongside COVID response. So I guess just to, to finish off um, before we open up for, for questions and discussion, you know, one of the things I think that has been on our minds over the last few weeks is, you know, how could outcomes-based contracts, you know, is there a role for outcomes-based contracts as a, as a mechanism for transparency and accountability as these very large amounts of money that are starting to flow from the World Bank, from IMF, from, from other sources into some low-income countries for the response effort? You know, are there ways, can we think together, I guess, about ways that that, that could be these approaches or these principles could be applied to support really impactful deployment of that funding. And I guess I'm thinking less about the immediate crisis response and more about the next six to 24 months. I'm thinking, you know, thinking about, is there a role for something like a, a slightly looser um, rate card, for instance, for some of these outcomes in some sectors? Um, might there be, um, you know, could we could we avoid some of the time for the real fine tuning of outcomes, valuations and, and, and payments? Can we circumvent that by just accepting that in some cases we'll be overpaying for outcomes, but that actually, you know, we could, that's that that overpayment may be offset in some way by the additional transparency and accountability benefit that comes with it. Um, I'm not sure we have any any clear answers on on that. But I'd be very interested to hear others' thoughts uh, about whether there's a almost a um, a slightly quicker and dirtier version of outcomes contracts that can capture a lot of what many of us on the call today will will see as the the values of these kinds of contracts, but maybe could be quicker to to implement. Thanks so much, Louis. There's so much to unpack in a very comprehensive context setting piece. And I think a lot of the things you've described around the adaptations and flexibilities that have sort of um, been used in the projects that you're involved in resonate with a lot of what we've been hearing on previous ergo calls around some of the responses in the UK. And you've mentioned kind of some of the ideas sort of like moving forward and the considerations around the suitability of social impact bonds, I suppose, in sort of more fragile or crisis environments. And I just want to sort of like unpick a little bit your last point around the, you know, can we look at sort of things like loser rate cards and so on. Do you think there's a sort of a bit of a trade-off to be made between sort of the, the flexibility that's, you know, certainly required on the one hand and then sort of like maintaining um, and focusing on um, outcomes, ensuring accountability. Is there a trade-off or do you think we can achieve both? Is transparency the, the answer in achieving that balance? Mm. I mean, it's always a difficult balance to get right. I think even when you have, you know, an, an indefinite amount of time theoretically to, to design a contract. I think, um, I guess what, I, I guess it feels like um, in a way outcomes-based contracts could be ideally suited to, to exactly the kind of recovery context that we're going to, we, we'll see, um, you know, by, by definition, they try to, to define outcomes in a way that doesn't presume the inputs that achieve those outcomes. Um, and, and that feels to me like in a context of quite radical uncertainty, um, not just about um, you know, what will happen within a sector, but within the broader context that any given intervention is happening within, that that might be um, a really valuable um, mechanism to build in 
to, to tie um, funding or at least, uh, well, and, and I think there's an interesting question as to whether you tie the funding to it, you know, are these investable content, top contexts, you know, are you trying to tie investment to it and get it repaid on an outcomes basis? Or are you instead doing something a little quicker and more iterative where you're setting, you know, six to 12 month targets we want to get to here, you're paying up front, but you're evaluating the impact that's happening and maybe contract extension or, or um, the contracts that the, the breadth of service provision of a particular provider could get extended on an outcomes basis. So it may not be about trying to create context where the, the payment comes at the end of the contract per se, but where you have these kind of checkpoints, interim checkpoints um, that are used to determine, you know, who are the providers who are really effective at serving these groups in this context at this time? And that might change over time. Um, uh, so I think there's, there's, there's value to the principles that drive these contracts, even if their precise form and format might, might shift a little bit to be uh, applicable. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Lewis. Um, I'd like to bring in Richard now. Um, I think I saw Richard on the line a couple of minutes ago. Um, so Richard has absolute decades of experience working on outcomes-based contracts um, in a range of different countries. Um, Richard, over to you. Um, I believe you're intending on um, speaking about your experience as the chair of the um, youth and employment in Pagond in the West Bank. So over to you. Thanks, Andrea. Um, yeah, as Andrea says, I, I work across a range of different outcomes contracts with the World Bank in Afghanistan and in Ethiopia, um, with a number of SIBs in the UK with Bridges as the investor. Um, but I want to talk this morning, this afternoon, about the West Bank and Gaza Finance for Jobs Dib. It's a youth employment program. Uh, we are paid for enrolling people on the program for some outputs some training completions and mainly for outcomes. Those outcomes being people starting in work and sustaining that work for 120, 180 days. Um, it's led by our DIB director in Palestine, Jalil, and our outcome payer, the person ultimately paying for these outcomes, is the World Bank, local implementation on behalf of the Palestinian Authority by DAI. We have four social investors, EBRD, uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, FMO, the Dutch Development Bank, PIF, which is the Palestinian Investment Fund, the sovereign investment fund for Palestine, and STO, which is a Chilean Palestinian investment fund. Current contract value is $5 million, um, and the duration is under discussion with there likely to be some extension. Uh, we went live late and actually started delivery at the beginning of this month. So it's actually been live in terms of delivery of services for a couple of weeks. It is a demand-led employment program. So the service providers are tasked with finding employers, identifying actual jobs as far as possible, engaging with job seekers, doing some soft and hard skills development, maybe some internships or on the job training, and then job matching. Um, we expect we might have about 10 programs running, and that might be four or five service providers delivering those 10 programs over the next two to three years or so, uh, achieving around 1,000 jobs. Um, and then, of course, um, COVID-19 comes and Palestine goes into lockdown and indeed has been in really quite strict lockdown for a number of weeks now. So uh, the employers are not working. The service providers can't deliver their services um, and the job seekers cannot be engaged with. The risk profile of this contract and of what the labour market looks like 12 months from now completely changes. This is a labour market already under considerable pressure. It is a weak labour market, which is why the DIV is there. And now we anticipate it getting even weaker. And one of those groups that is most likely to be particularly under stress in that sort of a market are uh, the youth, the young unemployed that we're seeking to target. Okay, but this is a DIB, so it is an outcomes contract. We're paid for jobs. So we have some flexibility and the ability to adapt. There is no prescribed delivery model. Those payments, as I said, are attached to the employment outcomes and then being sustained. The jobs themselves can be in any sector. We need to demonstrate we're adding some value with these jobs, that they're not just easy jobs, 
for people who would otherwise have achieved that employment, but we can target any sector. So the focus has quite rapidly shifted, as Louise indicated, to focus on the health sector. And we went live two weeks ago with a program that will look to provide soft skills and some hard skills training for nurses, following that up with placement in hospitals, with some internships leading into employment. We also have a program about to start for doctors. They all have to pass a licensing exam in Palestine. We're gonna be picking up the people who fail that exam and giving them additional training so that they can pass it. So they can then also get to work in the hospitals. And we're looking with the same provider to develop something similar, soft and hard skills mixture, followed by some on the job training and development for people doing home care work. So we've been able sh rapidly to shift the focus to a sector where there is this demand and work with the service provider to rapidly shift the way that they're going to be delivering this training. So the vast majority of it will be delivered online with some one-to-one -one stuff towards the end. And obviously there's PPE being purchased for that. We've been able to remodel all of the provision over the contract life so that uh, we can push some of our service provision further down the line um, to relieve some of the pressure on the early engagement and the early delivery. And the verification is shifting online as well. Now, at the same time as within the DIB, we have been able to adapt and be flexible. I think it is important to have a conversation with the commissioner, in this case, the World Bank, about the potential requirement for flexibility in the contract. The risk profile, as I say, has changed. And you need to be considering at this point whether there is continuing viability as well as affordability. So viability around initial cash flow at a time like this, when maybe the outputs or the outcomes are not being achieved as expected. And then affordability in, in the long term, are we gonna be able to achieve our contract cap of 5 million? Will, will we get there with our outcomes? We've talked then with the World Bank about shifting perhaps the percentage paid from outcomes to outputs. So do we start being paid more for people completing training than starting in employment? But we don't really want to do that. Um, if possible, we want to maintain the integrity of the model. We want to maintain all of the drive of this being payment for outcomes and all of that means. We talked about a period of grant funding or fee for service. This is what you've seen across a lot of SIBs in the UK. Um, and this is really addressing this question of viability. Now, the DIB is in a very early stage in Palestine. So actually, the sunk costs are relatively low. And our costs are directly tied mostly to the delivery of the service providers. So only as they start to deliver do we need to start to pay them. And because it's early days, we've got the early disbursements from the investors to draw down and to utilize. So that grant funding or fee for service shift is, we can do without it. What, what we're focusing on now, I think, is looking at extending the contract and potentially lifting the contract value. So if we extend it, we give ourselves longer to achieve the outcomes, but in extending it, we're going to increase the running costs of it. So in order to cover those running costs, we need to increase the contract value so we will deliver more outcomes. We'll keep the same structure of outcome payments, but we can deliver more outcomes to drive more income to cover those longer running costs. And um, that then currently remains under discussion with the bank. Um, that's how we're responding and adapting. Lessons to apply elsewhere. I mean, I think this is a great example of the strength of an outcome contract when those outcomes are clear, um, clean, measurable, easy, not overcomplicated by complicated rate cards or impact measured years down the line, but something that you can actually really quickly flex in order to deliver in a different way. Notwithstanding, there are huge challenges ahead. That's me, Andrea. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Richard. 
It's really so impressive and I must admit somewhat surprising to hear how quickly you were able to adapt uh, uh, your program to respond to the crisis, focus on the healthcare system. I was wondering if you can give us a bit more detail around what have been some of the enabling factors, you know, beyond the sort of like, I guess, in, you know, inherent structure of the social impact bonds. Was it the openness of the various stakeholders, the position of the World Bank as the outcome funder? Um, and perhaps as part of that, if you want to reflect a bit more on the sort of, you know, various conversations, who are the key stakeholders that you've had to bring into the conversations very early on? So we require, um, in principle, no objection from the World Bank for, for all of the contracts that are signed, all of the service providers that are brought on board. And the World Bank have actually been brilliant in terms of engaging quickly with us and engaging with us in ongoing discussions about both what that provision should look like, um, if and how the contracts should change, and indeed, and indeed our own contract with them. It has been possible, I have to say, because we were fortunate enough to have one of our early providers lined up already targeting the health sector. So we were already anticipating delivering the nursing training programme and at some point the doctors. And we'd started talking about the healthcare maybe coming a year or so down the line. The, house, the, the home care stuff. So we were able to bring that, we were able to speed that up, bring it on more quickly. Um, we've delayed a little bit some work with the Engineers Association, which targets people going into construction principally. Um, that will start in a month or so, but will those jobs actually be there at the end of that? Not quite so sure. The, the health ones really feel as if we've got a, a very tangible demand out there and as I say, it was possible because Jalil and, and some of the team from Social Finance have spent a couple of years already in Palestine identifying potential providers, identifying potential sectors, and it was that that we were able to, to feed off. Great, thank you so much. If I may, just another quick question for you, Richard. Well, I don't know if it's a quick one, um, but given that you chair social impact bonds both in the UK and internationally, I wonder if you could share a few reflections around some of the differences that you've seen in the UK as compared to other places, if indeed any. <laughs> it's quite a big question, Andrea, really. Um, look, I think it actually depends um, largely on the nature of the individual outcomes contract or impact bond and what the outcomes are, um, how complex they are, the impact obviously of COVID on what that service is and then on the commissioner and the commissioner's attitude and the point that the contract is in its lifetime. So there's quite a significant difference depending on whether it's started six months ago or it's, it's six months away from the end of it. Um, on the whole in the UK, um, looking across all of the bridges impact bonds now, they have all been able ultimately to adapt in some way. All of them have continued. In every single one of them, the commissioners has, has offered some degree of flexibility, possibly. Um, and because the services are all generally targeting vulnerable communities, they're targeting the communities that are, are getting hit hard by COVID. So they've been able to, to step slightly sideways possibly and continue to deliver a service of support in a slightly adjacent space. So in Kirklees, the one that was essentially around keeping people in their homes and addressing the, the potential homelessness has shifted to providing a, a, a helpline seven days a week um, both to individuals and services that just don't understand what's going on, know what's going on. They're delivering food, they're delivering message, um, medicines, they're going and talking to people through their door, making sure there's some social contact there. They're continuing a level of support that is making a huge difference and has been facilitated um, with this contract in early days by Kirklees Council agreeing to some fee-for-service payments so the viability of the contract remains. Um, whether that difference differs overseas, I mean, as I say, I, I also work in Afghanistan and Ethiopia. I'm afraid Afghanistan is, is just another matter altogether, where you have, uh, you know, we're talking there about COVID-19, plus um, a presidential election that hasn't quite been settled yet, plus the Taliban, plus whatever else is going on. Um, and as Lu Louise suggested, um, some huge concerns now about the secondary health consequences of COVID-19 and what that's going to now mean for infant mortality of 
basic health services can't, can't be delivered. So it's hard to read across to that. Really across to the, the dib in Palestine, I, it's, it's just benefits so much from being an employment dib with these clear, clean outcomes to be measured and paid for. Right, I see. Thanks for that, Richard. Um, and yes, I don't think we're going to get any sort of like quick questions or answers on this session, kind of given the complexity of the issues um, we're discussing. I think we've got time for a couple of questions from those of you on the line. So I think if anyone has any questions, uh, raise your hands, wave at the screen, uh, type your question in the chat box or just simply unmute yourself. I can't see any any hands waving, but I don't know whether Claire, do you see any? I don't see anybody. So maybe we move forward and see if folks um, have things they might want to pose to everybody at the end. Yeah. Oh. Look. Oh wait, I've got one question in from Lorato. So, does the Dib set a requirement for a certain level of wage? I think this is to you, Richard. Um. Simple answer is um, no. In, in securing the no objection from the World Bank, as I say, we have to demonstrate some, in some way that there is some added value so that these young people wouldn't have got a job without the intervention and that the job is just not a, it, they're not interested in entry level, lower level jobs. They've got to be jobs which appear to have some sort of career progression and, and long term um, potential to them. And they're very rigorous in their examination of this but there is no uh, requirement for, for any wage there. Great, um, thank you. I suppose please continue to add your questions to the chat and we'll uh, have more time towards the end of this session to look at those. Um, so from Palestine, we're virtually traveling all across to Latin America and over to Maria. Um, I guess from Louise's and Richard's presentations, it sounds like flexibility and the willingness of stakeholders to enable the continuation of services has been, have been fundamental um, in the impact bonds that they work on. Maria, I'm just wondering kind of what the emerging picture is in Latin America, across Latin American countries, obviously a very different context in different countries. And I know you've been doing some work collating responses from the various projects across the region. So it'd be great to hear more about that. Sure, thank you very much. And it's very nice to, to be talking to you all and learning so much about what's going on with, with SIPs and DIPs elsewhere in, in the world. Um, as, as Andrea has said, I'm, I'm here as ACROOKS and, and we are the performance managers and we also structure the, the SIP that is currently being implemented in Argentina. But I'm here also as part of the Latin American network of um, outcome payments that we've created together with colleagues that are either launching, implementing or have successfully exited SIPs across Latin America all the way from Mexico to Chile. So um, we've learned, I mean, we've, we've had various conversations about, about what's going on with the SIPs that are under implementation across LATAM. LATAM being a very diverse uh, region of the world with uh, exposed to various volatility issues and now toppled with, with the COVID scenario. Uh, and we could, we, could, we could see four main trends there that, that uh, were applicable to most of the SIPs uh, that we see across the region. The first one has to do with the flexibility and adaptability of the tool and how the fact that the, um, the tool uh, it banks on the collaboration amongst multiple stakeholders, including investors, governments, multilateral agencies, service providers, performance managers. Um, it, it makes from the start that the, the use of the tool is, is very flexible in its design. So when it's faced with a particular crisis, uh, all these actors coming together, thinking outside the box and adapting the tool to respond to the particular crisis, whether it is a macroeconomic crisis or whether it is COVID, make it work or make it go that extra mile that other development projects or uh, social programs in these countries do not have. The second thing is that um, the tool allows and, and, this, and this collaboration between multiple stakeholders to adapt certain contractual obligations 
uh, and operational and implementation uh, obligations that the different service providers have with investors and with the outcomes payer in order to make it work and in order to better respond to the situation. This we cannot see across the board in every country. Some, um, some contracts are less flexible than others, but it, it, is, it, is, a, it is a feature of the, of the tool that we, we find it's very uh, useful when dealing with uh, different kinds of crisis. Um, the third one is the fact that this kind of tool becomes extremely relevant for cash-strapped governments and for cash-strapped uh, outcome payers. And this is particularly relevant for Latin America. Uh, in a scenario such as the one posed by COVID or such as the one posed by a macroeconomic uh, downturn, um, for the governments to be able to tap on private sources of, of capital to resolve issues that they need to resolve either because it's a, it's a health issue like COVID or it's a macroeconomic issue like the one that Argentina is currently facing. Um, the, the fact that they can tap onto these resources and think a little bit more longer term on the solutions uh, that they need to put in place in order to, 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 to figure out an exit from this problem, uh, it's, it's, it's a very valuable thing for them. Um, and this not only applies to before COVID, but also, and, and very specifically, looking at after COVID. Many governments in the region will be even more cash strapped moving forward. And what, what this tool means is that they can um, basically tap on some of their connections and some of the of, of private investors in order to figure out exit strategies and reconstruction strategies for the, when they kickstart the economies again after the lockdowns that the different countries are experiencing. And the fifth one is that um, the fifth learning that we, we found, or the fourth learning, sorry, that we found collectively from the Latin American network is that if anything, this, this uh, COVID crisis will increase the number of vulnerable populations and issues that cut across them uh, that will be, um, uh, that, that could be attended by a, a SIB or a DIB or a outcome payments fund in the different in the different contexts. So, if anything, we'll have a, a more robust <laughs> um, pool of, of vulnerable individuals that uh, this this these instruments could help. I'm going to just tap on on very concrete examples coming from Argentina to to exemplify all the all the different big learning um, groups that I've just mentioned. Um, as many of you know, but just in case uh, um, some of you don't, Argentina has, uh, it's, it's now into a massive economic downturn, macroeconomic crisis, inflation running at 56%. We're entering the third year of recession, which uh, fully impacts employment, uh, and especially youth, youth employment. Um, we've had a change of government. Um, and to topple all that, <laughs> we have COVID and we have a full lockdown since the 16th of March in the country. The SIP uh, in Argentina is focused on employability of very underprivileged youth that live on the south of the city of Buenos Aires. This is individuals between 17 and 24 years of age that are 69% more vulnerable in the face of employment than their peers in other parts of the city. Um, the SIB in Argentina started being implemented already with the macroeconomic crisis uh, piling up and, and we had a change of government after one year of implementation. So it's a SIB that has been um, adapting its strategy and, and, and presenting solutions to the issues that were coming up ever since it started. In this particular scenario, uh, we responded and adapted by first adjust, adjusting the time frame for the completion of some of the, of the outcomes that we need to complete. And this has to do with the fact that because we're working with employability, uh, we, we are in full lockdown. Uh, we, we need to postpone some of the training courses and some of the interviews that these participants are going to uh, be, be taking part of. And, and hence, the expected time frame for achieving results has, has also shifted. Um, we have moved all our capacity building programs to virtual, and this has been with the support and the adaptability that the service providers have shown throughout the process. We are tapping on the economic sectors, a bit like in the Palestine case, that are showing demand. Uh, in the case of Argentina, it's entry-level positions, so that are showing demand 
at, at the in, within the current scenario. So this is supermarkets, pharmacies, um, um, different logistical jobs, different transport jobs. So we're trying to get our participants into the sectors that the economy is still um, demanding for um, and adjusting those payments by inflation which is at 56 percent until the COVID scenario passes so this this what, what this demonstrates is that we've all pulled together all the different players that are working in the SIB investors the government which is the outcome payer the service provider the performance manager to figure out solutions and to pitch in together to make it work um, despite the macroeconomic scenario, despite COVID, uh, the Argentine SIB is, is uh, performing at 35% at success rate, which is three times more than what other government programs that deal with employability, underprivileged individuals in general are presenting in the country over years that were not as, as bad as the current scenario. So the conclusion for this, for us, um, is basically that even though Financially, the SIB might not perform as much as we had anticipated when we uh, designed the SIB in 2018 and 2017. Sorry, in 2018. Um, in terms of results, the SIB is performing according to what we had um, originally set, set ourselves out to achieve. And this is a, a very robust proof that the tool itself works. And the tool itself works because it can adapt to various uh, stress tests and various complicated scenarios that are thrown at it one after the other. Um, this has to do with the fact that it's a flexible tool, that it's you can adapt it, and that it brings different players together to think of solutions outside the box. So thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. That sounds like a very positive picture emerging from um, Latin America, despite obviously the seriousness of the COVID crisis. So can I just check sort of then from the insights and reflections that you've been gathering from across the region, do you have a sense then that outcomes-based partnerships or outcomes-based approaches are likely to be seen as a you know, significant part of the sort of like post-COVID recovery efforts um you know what are different governments thinking is this sort of like seriously uh, on their radar and if so do you envisage particular sectors or vulnerable groups that might be supported through outcomes based approaches sure um it's it's different different scenarios in different countries but um yes this is a tool that is being discussed uh, as as part of the solution in many countries even for countries where SIBs might need to stop because the uh, the contractual setup is is, uh, is is not feasible anymore under a lockdown um it doesn't mean that they have crossed the uh, the, the 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 use of the tool altogether it means that they're in, in essence, protecting the tool for future use. So um, the, in, in cases across the region, uh, every, every, every implement to do is to be used in the reconstruction area. Some uh, conversations that I had, for example, in Uruguay or in Argentina about the use of the tool in the reconstruction area, are very positive. Uh, governments are very keen um, to use the tool, not only because it's presenting, it's presenting sort of positive results in various countries across the region, but also because of the uh, um, access to funding from alternative sources for the reconstruction area that they will need to tap on in order to, uh, to solve some of the issues that COVID lockdown presents. Yeah, and thank you so much. Um, well, lots of other questions, but I think it's only fair that I uh, check if um, any of the participants on the line have any questions for Maria. So I've actually got a question, um, which is around, you mentioned essentially, and, and this has been a theme across a lot of the ergo calls, around everyone pitching in to make a particular deal work. I'm curious if you can maybe provide people a bit more detail on what that looks like. So how have you constituted maybe quick fire calls with folks? Who's on the line? How long do you talk for? I think folks are really interested in getting a bit more detail in how you facilitate those conversations. Sure. I'll comment now just on the Argentine example because it's the one I'm, I'm heavily involved into. Um, and I think there's some of my colleagues from the network on the line, so they, they 
might provide more color on the on their um, on their sips. Uh, but basically, we um, we first convene the investors. That's that's our routine. Uh, first port of, port of well, the first port of call is the team itself. So we sit down and brainstorm and brainstorm and figure out uh, viable solutions that sometimes need to be checked with service providers and with the government, uh, depending on which solution we're proposing bef before pitching the solutions to investors. So our first point of call is we have a team call, we brainstorm, we say, okay, we have this roadblock, what do we do? Uh, we explore every possible scenario to, to solve the, block, the roadblock and, and once we have a good enough answer for many of the questions that we anticipate investors might have, we call, we, we call for a meeting with investors. To investors, we present, we send the information beforehand and we, we present the problem and the solutions. We also present a time frame for these solutions to be implemented. Once we have that and once investors approve, uh, we move on to talking formally to the government, which is the outcome payer, if needs be, or to the IDB, which is the, um, provides a loan to the investor group uh, for, for the continuation of the SIP if the outcome payments were not flowing fast enough, which is the case right now. Um, so once we have the approval from the investors, we either go back to the government and request a formal change or a formal um, uh, sort of tightening of certain um, issues that the government needs to look at, uh, etc. Uh, in terms of pitching in, I think for the Argentine SIB, all the players that are involved have been pitching in since day one. Um, so the idea is that we all win together and we all lose a little less together. Uh, and pitching in means first economically. Um, for example, in the current COVID scenario, service providers were paid three months in advance. Uh, and now we've all agreed that it's better to extend the cash flow as much as possible with the money in the, in the special purpose vehicle by uh, we all get paid once a month instead of three months in advance. And uh, inflation adjustments are not done now. They, would, they will be done after COVID passes. So at the end of this year, potentially. And what this means is it provides the SPV with some extra, extra cash in the, in the account in order to um, uh, spread pay in order to tap onto less resources from the loan provider. Uh, and this has to do, and this is a response to the fact that um, because of COVID, the government has stopped most payments to every service provider, including the outcome payments for this contract. So we need to maximize the, maximize the use of the cash we have available, hence why we're spreading the cost across the year. Uh, and delaying the, the payment of inflation adjusted uh, returns. Um, another way that we all pitch together is that when we need to find solutions, for example, for um, getting these participants into employment, we speak, for example, to investors that uh, speak to their connections that can open up some additional employment sources for the individuals uh, that are coming out of the SIP. Um, and also working together means, for example, service provider tapping on their networks as well to go into virtual capacity building and, and training uh, instead of, of in person, which is the way that the SIB was originally designed. And for that, they needed to, for example, buy data packages for the beneficiaries to be able to use. So tapping on their networks to get those data packages at a reasonable price, for example, uh, and then extending that, that benefit to the uh, participants of the program, well, it, it's all about working together to solve the issue. But the procedure is pretty much always the same. We brainstorm, we find solutions, we pitch to investors, and then we move forward with government service providers and the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, thank you so much, Maria. Just conscious of time and keeping the conversation going. I do, however, have one other question for Maria, if I may, Claire. Um, I want to promise it's a quick one, but it's probably, I don't know. Let's see. So it's just been great to hear everyone so far talk about the flexibilities afforded by the impact bond model, but perhaps maybe to play the devil's advocate a little bit, Maria, I'm just wondering from your experience with the social impact bond in Argentina, have there been any limitations or any, you know, points where you felt like, oh, I wish we would have thought of that when we first designed the contract or perhaps things that, you know, moving forward, you know, you'll maybe 
do slightly different uh, differently in future impact bonds. Absolutely, we have um, we have a small <laughs> book already of things that we would do differently that we're trying to apply for funds and SIPs. Um, a lot of the a lot of the learnings that we, we divide the learnings in three phases. The first phase is on the on the design of the contract phase and on the design of the, of that outcome payment contract for the government. And we were very straight jacketed in the building of of the of the, of the different um, of the different uh, clauses that that contract has, which are quite uh, co constraining. Uh, so the first uh, sort of the first learning has to do with how do you design an outcome payment contract where the government is the sole outcome payer uh, uh, in a country with the level of volatility, both political and economical, like, like Argentina. So learnings from there is uh, it's better in this volatile context to use uh, a mix of outcome payers and not just the government and not use just the government, because when things go wrong, you're stuck with a contract that you cannot really execute to your benefit if if everything goes pear-shaped like it is uh, at present with COVID. Um, so that's learning number one. Uh, learning number two from that particular uh, phase of sort of the design of the contract phase is that um, no essential part of the service provision needs to be tied to the outcome payer. In our case, the outreach and, and scouting for participants for the program uh, was, was the responsibility of the government, something that the government was never able to provide. Hence, it, it, it sort of, um, this was loaded onto the service providers uh, task without any payment being adjust, uh, adjusted for that or, or anticipated for that. So any essential part of your service provision or of your outcome achievement cannot be tied to the outcome payer because there's a massive conflict there. Um, then on the on the on the more of the implementation phase or on the financial modeling phase, um, if you're working in volatile context, we had estimated double the time that it would take the government to repay outcomes. Um, that that's and that didn't even work out. So you need to estimate maybe three times what they tell you that it's going to take them to repay, or set up payments so that they're done at the end instead of um, staggered across the way because then you can financially prepare uh, your model so that it responds to that in a better way. In terms of uh, the implementation, um, we are finding that the most flexible service providers are the ones that are achieving best results. So if the service provider is not flexible, it should be, um, well, it, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for this model. Um, and and it somehow, service providers need to be rewarded or punished if they're not being flexible enough to adapt, uh, which is something that this particular pilot uh, did not, uh, did not uh, take into account or did not include. Uh, but in the future, if the service providers are big enough um, and if they're not adapting fast enough, then you should be able to reward or punish. Reward the ones that are doing it and punish the ones that are not. Um, and that's in terms of the of more of the implementation phase of, of the SIP. Uh, I'll stop there because I know we're short of time, but there's a million learnings that we're collating in a, in a mini book. Thank you. And please do share all those learnings. Um, with us. Thank you so much for, um, for such an open, I guess, an honest overview of the situation um, in Latin America. Right, from Latin America, I'm taking us over to South Asia. So it's over to ABBA from the British Asian Trust, who will tell us more about the adaptations on the quality education in India. Deep and ABBA, if we have time, perhaps some sort of like broader reflections in terms of the responses that you've seen uh, with the government in India. Thank you, Andrea and the GoLabs team. And hello to several people. We were together in February in London and how the world has changed since we were together. So um, I was going to do two things. While several points that I was going to speak of have come up already, I wanted to bring two bigger context pictures that I think really matter um, as I've been listening to all of you. One of them is that the funding landscape is, is changing dramatically. All funders are going to reduce the funding they have for um, what they're saying is optional things to perhaps focusing on vaccinations, health programs, Bilateral funding is down. Uh, I speak to Convergence regularly. They tell me that, um, and we know that from our partners as well. 
So in this context of funding that's going to be focused on getting the back world back on its feet, what is the role of an impact bond? It's a question that I think about quite a lot. The second is as BAT, we run grant programs as well as impact bonds. And one learning I'm trying to get by looking at the way our grant programs are responding versus our impact bonds is, is it that impact bonds are more, are they, are they really more flexible or is this because I love an impact bond and therefore I'm going to say it's collaborative, it's this and it's that and therefore it's more flexible. I don't have an answer for that because for some of our grant programs, they moved from skilling programs to cash transfer programs overnight uh, because they could and they had to. Uh, and that's what the community needed. We couldn't do that on an impact bond. On the other hand, it could also mean that a grant program could lose money from a focus on outcomes to outputs and maybe not even the outputs very quickly. And therefore, the, the loss of focus on outcomes actually has eventual downfall for a program. And that's where an impact bond becomes important. So I, want to, I wanted to put those two macro points on the table for participants as well, because that's something I think about lots, quite a lot. If there's going to be less money and less and the immediate the funder's immediate reaction is an impact bond is going to take time to develop. What is the role of an impact bond in, in the coming months? So as push, that's, that's, that's the response of everybody who's come. So I'll tell you uh, very quickly about our education impact bond and then a new one that we are developing with the government of India, which actually um, brilliantly got signed off this week. So I'm, uh, I'm a very happy person actually uh, in that context. So our quality education impact bond is a $11 million education dip, 200,000 beneficiaries. It's four year long program, 15 partners. Um, I would say the top education providers in the country uh, and an excellent evaluator. And in March, uh, around the 25th of March, as we were ending our second year of our program, having had excellent year one results on learning outcomes increasing, we were starting to, uh, you know, the data collection on year two results was ongoing, final year exams were ongoing. Um, and uh, and, and lockdown happened in India. And with lockdown, one massive thing happened in India that I'm sure all of you know is that communities uh, who lived in the in towns started and cities started migrating back to villages and, uh, and their own hometowns. Uh, and what and, and what we realized is our communities, the children in our schools, were, were children of those migrant laborers. So many of them have gone back to their villages. So quite a big deal for us. But school was coming to an end and summer holidays were coming and with that the mango season. So what did happen is summer holidays came forward. So it, the impact on our dip has not been immediate. So it is going to be longer term. And that's the point of difference from some of the other dips. Is that in an education impact bond where schools are not going to open for a long period of time, children aren't going to come back, perhaps even for a longer period of time and the social and emotional impact on these children is going to be huge. Our work in the consortium, as collaborative as every other consortium, is that of thinking about the long term. And those are live discussions. What we've set is some principles. And the principles are that learning matters even if there are lockdowns or if there's COVID, because those children require that for their own mental well being and their own. Uh, I think that school serves much more purpose than just a place of learning, it's also a place of their safety and other things. And we must get our providers back on their feet doing what they do for the children. Uh, in the coming months. We have all agreed to be flexible about that. We've all agreed to be frugal with our costs about that. But the way the whole, the way in which we will have to solution, find solutions will depend a lot on when lockdown lifts in India properly and the situation becomes more clear. For now, we have principles based on outcome targets where we've all said we will agree to change. Every single investor and funder on the program seems comfortable with flexibility in changing the model, either reducing outcome targets if required or any other change. But we don't have that clarity right now in India. And it is a wait and watch game for a couple of months where we are with our providers, helping them um, learn, helping them think of adaptation. The one thing, a comment about India is India hasn't seen a shock to its system for a really, really long time. There's been growth in the country. The country's done well. One real astonishing fact about our providers I found is that they were deer in headlights when, when um, and lockdown struck. They were not our usual innovative Indian partners that everybody talks about. They were really struck by how difficult lockdown was going to be for their work. And in that, actually, what we felt as a team was we turned actually to Africa and we reached out to Emily at Brookings, who was putting out all this art, these articles on Ebola and how some of the African education partners had responded and asked her to capacity build our service providers in India. And she's going to be doing that actually this week. Um, since we share learnings from different contexts, that we in India can understand how our providers can go back to school, practice social distancing, think about 
uh, classrooms which might be stag classes that might be staggered through the day use whatsapp a lot better look at virtual learning understand that we don't have that kind of digital access for families the father might own the mobile phone it doesn't mean the child can practice his abc on that um, so you know that's the reality of virtual learning i might be able, have two children on zoom downstairs learning that isn't the reality for my counterpart in in gujarat um, and we had to take that into consideration so it's a live day we're learning the summer holidays have extended so it's not an immediate impact but the conversations within the consortium are big the question is whether whether those conversations would have been the same whether it was a grant or an impact bond that is my bigger question in my head for now i think the philanthropic minded group that we have around us in the in the edge in the qei dib makes all those discussions possible i wonder if we hadn't been a philanthropic lot what would that what would those conversations sound and be like um that's on qei i had a lot more detail for you on what service providers are doing lots of really exciting things but i'll move on so you can ask me questions if you have any um the second pivot that we did and here's where uh, i speak to something everybody talked about from louise to richard uh, to maria um is that in an employment context impact bonds can be very exciting and we were in the middle of a conversation with the uh, with the big agency of uh, the employment uh, organization that that government of india as where the, the organization that's responsible for all of skilling programs in india and just after covid we called them and said so what's happening to our sib and they said well every single service provider in 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 the country is closed um and all migrants have gone back to their villages so there's no one to train and this is this is to richard context the world had changed overnight and the sectors perhaps what they were training for didn't want people anymore so the world was very different but what they realized as well was that the procurement policies that they had with their service providers were not future proofed for a time where inputs were not clear they would they realized that all their providers would start having to do distance training models and digital training models and that they needed to adapt their procurement and financing policy of service providers very quickly and here's where they've agreed to come on board and to to launch an impact bond by september this year which will allow us to train Uh, to provide training for people in two value chains the ones uh, again richard brought that up as well as in healthcare and and logistics the two sectors that are crying out loud for uh, for people and and talented skilled labor and we will be testing the work with a different set of inputs focused on outcomes and placement outcomes and again i can give you a lot more detail the 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 point i think i want to make on that one is that the flexibility of an outcomes contract does work in a context like that where a big funder needs to pivot their entire model on the way they provide skilling in india and they can't do it with an existing government schemes and here's where they've seen the value of it we've seen the value of it um i'm going to stop andrea and i'll allow you to ask ask people to ask questions because i put a few thoughts there and i also want to give the others on the call time to speak later Thank you so much Avarti you've put a lot of thoughts out there and uh, not just a few I certainly got a lot of questions but I will hold off because I know we have a few other um, incredible speakers lined up with the concluding thoughts but I think on everyone on the session just I thank you so much for bringing our attention to this hugely important point around sort of like the need to keep in mind the sort of this question around how do the flexibilities and the speed of adaptations within an impact bond model compare to other funding mechanisms um i suppose for those of you familiar with the work of the gola that sort of a fundamental question that we're trying to answer to our research and i think the sort of like covid crisis is sort of like throwing new challenges and interesting insights um into that question but thank you so much for sort of articulating that so clearly for us um all right clay i think it's over to you now and thank you so much to our four incredible speakers so over to clay uh for the sort of final uh section for today's session uh yeah amazing i that was i found myself completely sort of lost in my own thoughts and trying to think through how i can pull in a lot of the information that you've shared in particular about different entities coming together to work uh collaboratively the order of that as sort of laid out by maria um really thinking about the role of impact bonds or an outcomes orientation in recovery i think there's lots of things to pick up on and so i'm excited to sort of hear from 
uh, the, the next set of folks, as it were. Um, given the constraints on time, I might suggest that in lieu of folks having to provide their own summary comments, if they've got a question to the panel, they can feel free to pose that as well. So um, if you are listed in the next part of the agenda, you've got a sort of dealer's choice of question to the panel or indeed uh, providing some distillation commentary as, as, as we discussed. So I'm gonna follow the order that we've listed here. So Radana, I think I saw your name on the call. I'll pass things over to you. Yes, uh, hi everybody. Hopefully this is working and you can actually hear me, uh, but Claire, please try out if you can't. I can hear you. Uh, it would be good to talk it's slow. Good. I okay. think the signal's slightly delayed. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll try. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Radana Kova. I lead the impact investing team uh, at the Department for International Development. Um, I think I'll go just for a very light uh, and quick uh, sort of distilling of what I've heard today, because I think a lot of that um, really resonates and a lot of that is relevant to the way that we are thinking uh, about and trying to understand what's happening and um, next steps and what this might mean for our work on impact bonds uh, going forward. Um, so why this matters to us in DFID uh, a lot. Um, first of all, we have uh, three uh, pilot impact bonds currently live under our pilot programs, but um, also in January this year, we announced uh, uh, an ambition to scale up um, through much larger outcomes funds through supporting the knowledge and learning um, ecosystem around impact bonds and outcomes based contracts um, and through uh, offering uh, wider assistance to uh, scoping new opportunities uh, in uh, in the field uh, with uh, domestic governments in, in a lot of developing countries as well. Um, so the COVID impact for us and the really main question that we're asking is, well, is all of this still relevant? Uh, do we need to pause and rethink? Um, uh, it, does it make sense to uh, go forward? And I think what I've heard today, and I think I would summarize what we are seeing um, as well is two types of adaptation. One, um, service providers really adapting in delivery and figuring out uh, new ways of, uh, of um, shifting uh, their models, whether it's delivery online or through um, you know, any other ways really of getting in touch with people uh, on the phone, uh, even schooling on the radio in, in developing countries. So that's one, the sort of delivery adaptation uh, to the contracting adaptation uh, as well. So, uh, you know, heard Richard summarize that really well in re renegotiating contract terms, thinking about switching through grant funding, or is it extensions and lifting values of contracts? I think all of those things being really actively considered on um, all impact bonds. I think two particular challenges then in, in uh, one arising sort of in, or very specific, I think, to lower and middle income countries uh, around the delivery adaptation and the infrastructure that's available. And Abha uh, alluded to that in terms of um, access to technology and access to um, the tools and infrastructure that will enable you to learn online or to receive job mentoring online. Um, and that's not going to make adaptation very easy to us. The second challenge is on contracting, and I think that's a particular one for impact bonds. I think more and more diverse parties to a contract means that contracts might be slightly more uh, difficult to uh, renegotiate. And again, we are kind of in the midst of all this, so it might take a while to understand. Um, but two, uh, again, kind of uh, glimmers of hope, or I think offsetting factors to that in impact bonds. Um, one is uh, sort of service provider culture, right? And the fact that uh, within, these, uh, within this type of contracting, we have specifically focused on providers who are um, willing to come and uh, work with us and adapt delivery day to day um, uh, to the relevant context. And that's not just specific to uh, the situation we're in right now, uh, but that's delivery, delivery far more broadly and really adapt, use data to drive what you do and how you do it, who you work with and drive for that outcome. Um, secondly, then, and the offsetting part on the contracting challenge is uh, the incentive alignment, right? And I think what we've seen and what we're starting to see in practice is 
uh, we're all aligned behind that goal and behind wanting to achieve outcomes for um, for the very poorest people, right? And that's investor, service provider, and donor um, alike. It's making those conversations uh, a lot less tense, uh, to be honest, than I'd expected. So I think the final test uh, in this um, will be in, you know, can these contracts, can we continue to add value? Can we continue to focus on the end result, whether it's jobs and incomes and grades and learning and availability of water and sanitation? Essentially, can we continue to make sure the services are there for the people who need them uh, most? Can we do it in a way that's better uh, than traditional grants? I think time will tell, and I think James Ronickle is here uh, today and might be able to reflect on the sort of how we test the are we doing better. For now, we're focusing on can we just do it? Can we continue um, to provide the service? In the longer run, um, I think some of the things that I think uh, have been highlighted to us as potential areas of focus are um, investing in building better contracts. Um, very often I see the contracting bit as a sort of necessary evil in uh, impact bonds, but can we actually pay a lot more attention to this into the plan Bs, into contracts that are resilient to potential huge shifts in uh, context? Uh, and secondly, can we, uh, you know, is there more potential to stretch ourselves on, on um, investing into technology and to, uh, into uh, helping uh, both providers and evaluators adapt um, as well? Um, so that's kind of all from me. Amazing. Thank you for that, Radana. I will say I'm going to give everybody a chance to speak. So we will probably continue slightly past the um, I'm in Belgium, so it's 3.30, but it's 2.30 in the UK. Um, so uh, if you have to leave, we will miss you. We hope to see you next week, but we will give everybody a sort of a chance to, to think through things. Um, and with that, I'd like to pass it over to Lorato. Thanks, Claire. Um, and I'm sorry I can't turn my video on. I prefer you hear me rather than see me. My connectivity isn't great. We can hear you. Um, so yeah, in the interest of time, I mean, I'd Thanks to all the panelists. I think that's been really insightful, particularly um, Maria and Richard speaking about the youth employment uh, DIB. As some of you may know, I run Bonds for Jobs, which is an impact bond um, platform in South Africa focused on inclusive youth employment. And I think without diving into the specifics of our program and of how we've had to shift and pivot uh, in the last little while, I think just two things. Um, first, the point made by Abba around the flexibility um, that may or may not exist in impact bonds, just given the number of stakeholders. And I mean, I think I agree with that, particularly, and I'm not sure if any of the panelists had commercial investors in their uh, structures. And just to Abba's point is, it's great to have a bunch of philanthropic stakeholders who are like-minded and are willing to pivot into more no return type of models. In our case, because we've got two institutional investors on our bond who are very flexible and are very social minded, but their institutional mandates don't allow them to take a loss. So that automatically uh, impacts or limits how far we can pivot to a no return scenario. So I tend to agree with Abba on that. And for me, just in terms of the outlook of these financing instruments, it suggests that you know the scalability of these instruments or applicability across much broader context is limited if it's going to depend on individuals who are really um, aligned to that extent. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is, I think, um, particularly in developing countries, the um, you know pre-crisis uh, constraints on public financing, um, low levels of um, internet penetration, um, just really limit how well we can pivot to operating virtually. So even though there is flexibility within the structure to go for virtual service provision um, and corporates may be trying to adapt to um, 
social distancing in the workplace, our ability to do all of that is constrained by you know, pre-crisis conditions. And I think the interesting thing for us is a lot of the solutions that are required in our bond to pivot are solutions that are going to be undertaken outside of the bond and not necessarily with the stakeholders of the bond. So there's such a great dependency on processes that are not sitting within the bond, um, if that makes sense. And just trying to understand how participants in a bond, either contractually or not contractually, plug themselves into those processes, which involve the state a lot, but also business, um, is something that we're grappling with. So yeah, in the interest of time, I'll pause there. I think that was really helpful, in particular your comments around the um, differences potentially with the involvement of commercial investors, and as well this idea that the solutions that might get taken up are actually maybe more contextually based or, or situationally based outside of, of folks who are immediately privy to the, the impact bond itself. Um, James, I'm going to pull you in. Uh, thank you, Claire. <clears throat> thank you both to GoLab, but also all the speakers today. Um, it's quite a fast moving world and even I've sort of struggled to kind of follow everything that's going on. So having these on a regular basis is really helpful. Um, I have three uh, provocations, if you like, to uh, some of the things that people said. Uh, I'd be very interested to get people's responses, if possible. The first one was to Louise and um, the comments you were saying, Louise, about uh, can this type of model be used in the post-COVID response and maybe not a full impact bond, but can some of the principles of that be applied in a sort of quicker, simpler way? Which I think is the million dollar question we've all been asking ourselves for the last two years, is how can we do this more quickly and simply? So I think that if, you know, they say necessity is the mother of all invention, and if COVID forces us to think about how can we do this more quickly and, and, and simply, I think that would be fantastic. I think the warning shot to that is the devil is in the detail. And what we found in many of these impact bonds is actually, if you don't get the design right, you open yourselves up to a whole load of perverse incentives. So doing things, doing something like this quickly and simply may be a solution, but it actually poses the risk of making things worse, not better. Um, so that's, I think that's just something to bear in mind. The second point, this is based on a, a fairly small sample, but I think what is interesting hearing the discussions today and hearing about what's going on in the UK, and, and maybe we can pick this up in the next session, is it feels like the impact bonds in low and middle income countries have been far more resilient to stick to the impact bond than in the UK, where it feels like there has been a quicker reaction in the UK to go to fee for service and go, we can't do outcomes in this, we're going to go to fee for service. And is that because, and, and why is that? And is that maybe because building what ABBA said around looking how Africa has responded to crisis, actually, are we dealing in low and middle income countries with contracts and procurement that is far more resilient and used to responding to crises? So this is just another crisis. I mean, building on Latin America, when we were talking to Chile, they were like, well, all our services had to close six months ago because of the strikes. So we're used to national crisis of this measure. So are loan, is there a lot to learn from low and middle income countries? Are they more resilient to this actually than in high income countries? That was my second point. And my third point, uh, maybe again, it's for next week, is kind of, I found all these conversations really helpful. The one that's been at the back of my mind that I don't feel anyone is really talking about at the moment is um, what do you do with investors? in this scenario, and in particular, when you shift to a fee for service. So if the underlying idea of this is, I'm transferring risk away, we may, and the investor's taking on that risk, and therefore it's perfectly legitimate they get a return. Well, the minute that you stop paying on outcomes and you start to pay back on fee for service, that investor's not taking on any risk anymore. So should they also, be take, should they also receive the return? And actually the cabinet office guidance on payment by results is that, you shouldn't be paying for uh, profit margins on services that aren't being delivered. And I, I have, I've read that and I've not heard that being mentioned once. And arguably the investor return is a profit margin. So if we're going to shift these, even in the short term, to a fee-for-service, what do we do about the investor return? So they're my three 
ponderings, if you like. I love those three provocations. And I think what I would like to do is tell you to be on next week's call. Um, and indeed, that will actually be the structure for a lot of the conversation next week. And so indeed, if that's relevant to other folks as well, next week, uh, Wednesday at 3.30 UK, we will be picking up a lot of these kinds of questions in particular around the what do you do with investors provocation and thinking through the changes now, whether that is to insist on the impact bond versus to uh, switch over to something that looks more like fee for service. Doing that now has ramifications for six and 12 and 18 months from now, depending upon the sort of duration of your project. And we should be thinking about decisions now as they affect decisions and realities later. Um, but uh, I, I know that we've got a couple more people that I'm really keen to hear from. And uh, Sope, I have you next on my list of folks to touch in with. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so my name is um, Shopa williams Alegbe, and I work at Stellenbosch University. Um, so just a couple of, co of comments that I have. So I'm, I'm looking at this not necessarily from, from the um, impact bonds perspective, but just looking at public procurement systems on the whole and how they fared so far, looking at Sub-Saharan Africa, South Africa, Nigeria, um, and what are the likely um, changes that we have to make post COVID-19. So I think everyone will agree that we, um, you know, our current procurement models haven't been able to um, rise to this challenge. Um, we've had ob obviously issues with transparency and corruption and, um, you know, in, in, in jurisdictions where we're, we're short of money and have already been facing economic um, issues. It, it's, not, it's not good for, for anyone. So what I've been thinking about is what, what do we need to do differently um, as we are in the pandemic, but also more importantly, to move forwards. So, I mean, some of my, my top um, thinkings <laughs> have been that we, we really need to think of a way that we will um, integrate framework contracts and outcomes-based contracts into our procurement systems, especially in the health sectors. Um, I think that we really need to move to more centralization of procurement in key sectors. Um, we have to look at securing the security of our supply chains. And this may not be a popular idea, but really less of China and other producers and more of domestic and regional producers. Because what happened for us was that we, you know, because of, of the fact that we're trying to secure goods on a global market um, and in, in, in areas where there were shortages, we entered into a bidding war with Western countries that we cannot win. Um, it doesn't work for us. So I think that hopefully the, the um, African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is supposed to open our markets and open our borders within Africa, would hopefully help us get to a place where we can secure some of the, the things we need from within the continent and not so much relying on um, producers in, in, in you know, Western Europe or, or in Asia. Um, and I think the last thing is in trying to secure more transparency we must really be thinking seriously about integrating um, beneficial ownership requirements into our procurement systems and you know hopefully in future moving towards some form of public registry um, so those are, are i think the the main thoughts that i have and thank you for everyone and thank you for for letting me be on the call as well it's been really interesting Thank you for that. I think really helpful to broaden the perspective a bit here. In particular, I'm thinking also about some of the comments made prior around how the solutions are likely to come from things outside of the impact bond. And indeed, shoring up perhaps domestic or more proximate supply chains for key things is a, is a huge element of that. And I think we can't forget that that context has so much variation depending upon where you are in the world. Um, so Avnish, you've got the enviable, enviable position of tying all of this up in a beautiful bow. Um, so I'll, I'll pass it over to you before we say goodbye. Thank you. Very difficult position, but I'll try. Um, so th thanks, thanks a lot, first of all, for organizing this, uh, this, this meeting. I, I thought it was really interesting to hear everybody's uh, perspective. Um, so I wanted to come in mostly on a question that I think Andrea put to the group earlier and also that ABBA later picked up, which is, you know, what is the role of outcomes-based contracts uh, post-COVID or as part of the COVID response? Uh, what is the role of impact bonds? Um, 
and obviously like you, we got to think of time frames here at some point in time when things slow down and calm down i think we will we hope to get back to normal and be able to resume activities as we have been doing them but but mostly focusing my my comments on the very short term so what we're seeing in in our countries where we work uh, with governments is that impact bonds in the very short term don't seem to be a great idea um, uh, for multiple reasons right impact bonds are generally small projects innovation oriented uh, governments are thinking about much larger scale, unprecedented, unprecedented, uh, unprecedented scale at this point in time. Uh, we're talking about tens of billions of dollars of uh, spending in countries uh, over a very short period of time. So scale is is going to be potentially a mismatch. Then there is the question of the cost and time invest, investment required to structure these multi-party arrangements. And our government counterparts are absolutely constrained in terms of the bandwidth to put these deals together. So. So that's going to also be a challenge. Uh, third, I think uh, impact bonds seek to, uh, to, to some extent by design, transfer risk to the private sector and environment where private sector is hoping to have governments absorb those risks. Uh, and they also require us, traditionally speaking, and again, we can think of different types of impact bonds, but traditionally speaking, they require us to be quite clear about our expectations of results and how they're going to play out in an environment where few people are able to actually predict that and things are changing quite heavily. Uh, so, so all in all, it seems, you know, not necessarily traditionally, traditionally designed impact bonds. And again, there's no such thing as traditionally designed impact bonds, but as, as far as I know them, they don't seem to be a great fit for the very short term. At the same time, I think this community as a whole, you know, where we've been uh, thinking about uh, how to achieve outcomes and how to get them uh, to be achieved in faster ways and better ways, I think we have an unprecedented opportunity and the opportunity is that uh, at least we've never seen our government counterparts be so outcomes driven. Um, it's clear there's high stakes around the health outcomes, around the economic recovery outcomes, around the social protection outcomes. They're being asked to deliver, uh, you know, the results have never been more visible. Uh, there's almost a, a global comparison on the performance of government. So this is sort of like, uh, an excellent opportunity for this community to act and to bring its assets and its expertise forward to serve the moment. Uh, there's an inbuilt, if you will, incentive to deliver and to, to achieve results, which is fantastic in some ways. Uh, so how do we respond to that? And I have like sort of three areas of, of action that I think we as a community can take to serve the moment, if you will. And they mostly re relate to the capabilities that organizations on the call have developed over time and have sort of really refined over time and are bringing to the work on uh, every day, right? So, so the first capability I would say is our ability to design flexible contracts. And, and I think many folks on the call have, have picked up on that point and, and mentioned it. Uh, and, and flexible contracts respond to the huge innovation need that's needed at this point in time. Uh, governments are being asked to overnight rethink uh, solutions or think of new solutions to complex problems that they've never faced before. So how do we uh, deploy flexible contracts to source innovation, to measure the quality of this innovation and to provide rapid insights to governments? And one of the examples of that, we were a few months away from launching uh, you know, a, an outcomes fund here in Colombia with uh, traditional SIPs being sourced by the government. We've put that on pause and we're instead trying to think, uh, and this is in the employment uh, space as well, we're instead trying to think how do we quickly uh, you know, design innovative challenges uh, that are going to provide the space and the funding and the flexible contracts for private sector organizations to be able to sort of, to develop solutions that the government may be needed uh, to uh, advance the inclusive economic recovery for those who don't have jobs. And obviously the financing structure is completely different. It's much more upfront. Uh, the measurement is happening within very short time frames. So you're not really thinking about outcomes, but rather trying to get to the quality measures of a prototype. So, so flexible contracting is something we can put at the service of government. The second thing that we can put at the service of governments is performance management capabilities. Uh, I think many of us have gotten sort of to develop really good capabilities in uh, you know, providing the sort of like business intelligence equivalent to the social sector in the delivery of programs. How do we uh, get a real time insight on whether policies are working or not? on whether programs are, are being effective, what parts of the theory of change are active or not, for which populations were being effective or not. 
so, so there's a huge need for our government to have real-time data and real-time insights on their policies and how well they're working. Almost all policies that are being rolled out are experimental in nature. Uh, there's no track record for them. Uh, so we are having to develop tools to performance management really fast. So one example of that was we're working with the Colombian government right now to, uh, to establish a performance management system for the economic recovery package. Uh, where they're going to be tracking multiple different policies and understanding where it's working, where it's not, and being able to make this real-time course correction. So that's another capability we can bring to the to, to the space. And the final one is, I think we've gotten really good at uh, as a community as, at thinking about incentives and how they work and how, how they provoke behavioral response. And that's another area where governments are trying to think hard. A lot of these policies are meant to incentivize certain behaviors are meant to provoke a certain type of reactions from populations, from citizens, from providers. So how do we help them really think hard about uh, the purpose incentives, the productive incentives, and how do you really structure this? So I think we have an unprecedented, unprecedented moment to, 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 to respond. Uh, the response will likely need to be very different from what we're used to doing in terms of what we do, uh, but uh, the skills and the capabilities that we have developed over time can be very much deployed in this moment. I think that's a really helpful way to frame this conversation. So, you know, we can think about this in two parts. One, about how we take the work that we have done in the projects that currently exist and redeploy and readapt and really think through how to make those live and, and, and in service of the, the populations that we uh, support. But then, as Avnish has pointed out, maybe we also need to reflect a bit more critically about how these become um, increasingly or, you know, maintain their um, viability and credibility and salience in a, in a new world in that regard. So I'm sensing perhaps that we need to have maybe another ergo session, which is really around thinking about outcomes contracts and impact bonds in a recovery mode and, and, and how we can make those um, solutions that are fit for purpose for the new context that we're all sort of uh, experiencing mutually. Um, thank you everybody for staying on. I know we've run a bit past time here, but I think the conversation and the ideas on the table were compelling enough to keep most folks attention. Um, and again, thank you so much for everybody who has taken time out of their schedules to speak and present and offer comments. I've got a list of all of the questions that have been put out uh, in the chat today. So we will pick up on a lot of the sort of topics related to changes and reprofiling and remodeling on impact bond projects next week um, on the 13th of May. So I definitely invite folks to keep those questions and bring them with them uh, next week. And thank you again. And I hope the rest of your week runs smoothly. And I look forward to seeing everybody's face soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye, everyone.